how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie. Expecto Patronum. Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this conversation, I sit down and chat with Robert Horn. Robert wrote the book for Tootsie, the musical. He's also done a whole lot of other writings as well. We cover a good amount of them. He talks about the beginning of his career, um, his inspirations, his mentors, and he drops some wonderful knowledge bombs about perseverance and pushing for what you want in life to make sure you strive to get it. I, he does a much better articulation of this, and I do hope that you uh, hear it, listen to it, maybe grow from it, because he was incredibly generous with his advice. So, Robert, thank you for chatting with me. That was a wonderful conversation. And everyone, I hope you enjoy. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe, and today with me is Robert Horn. Robert, hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? Now, do you, is it Clay or Clayton? Do you, you know what? People who know me call me Clay. The podcast is called okay. Clayton Howes Entertainment X. You know, either one. Uh, I love, uh, you know, I've always, I've always loved Clay. Oh, really? Do you so, know many Clays? <laughs> no, but I played with it often as a child. Oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> so... Clay, it is. How are you? Nice to talk to you. Yes, this is going to be a wonderful, and it's nice to talk to you. This is going to be a wonderful conversation. I know you've been, we've just been talking about how we keep changing time zones. You, you were doing Tootsie. You have some projects you're working on over in LA. Um, but I want to go back to the beginning of time for Robert Horn. What what were your theater dreams as a kid? Um, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I've always loved theater. Uh, my theater dreams, I guess, were, well, they are to do what I'm doing, but kind of, you know, I think we all, we all, all us little creative types start off wanting a te- want to, wanting a, te- oh, someone's at my front door. It's like, um, we all start off wanting attention. And yeah. so, um, I think we all wanted to be performers, which I started off as, but was realized early on that that should not and was was not my calling and should not have been and I was horrible at it um, <laughs> but loved the creation of characters loved and it, it took me a little while to realize you know this is what I should be doing but you know my my mom um, was a theater girl grew up in New York and was a theater girl and actually was I've talked about this before. She was Ed Sullivan's secretary mm-hmm. and used to work with all the theater performers. You know, all the, all the Broadway shows would come on the Ed Sullivan show. She would deal with all the talent and loved theater and took me to my first musical when I was like five or six. And, um, and, and I, and I always loved it. And I always knew that's what I wanted to do. I don't know if it was nature or nurture, but uh, I just never didn't want to do that. And so I think the dream was to just sort of have the opportunity to be able to do that and figure out what that meant. And, you know, I didn't know anybody or, or know where to even start, but just trust that life takes you on the journey you're supposed to be on. Wow. Now, you grew up in New York? I did. I grew up in, I was born in Connecticut, but at a very young age, moved to Brooklyn uh, and grew up in Brooklyn and lived there till I was about nine and then was upstate New York uh, in a place called Pleasantville uh, and then back in the city. And now, so yeah, I'm a New York kid. Now, a lot of my questions are based off of things I find on the internet and it can be often mistaken uh, or true. Uh-oh. So uh-oh. fact check no, I'm, me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Okay. But is it, is it true you studied at Circle in the Square? That is true. That is. Uh, NYU, uh, NYU, at Tisch, NYU had a theater program, and you could study at either Circle, Strasburg, or, or Adler. Right. Um, and I chose Circle. And I, and I, what happened was, I was living in, I was living on Thompson Street in the village, and I would see all these NYU students, because I was right by the university, and I was like, God, I, I would love to go there. And so I applied to the theater department um, in the, uh, for the acting, you know, at Tisch for, as, 
as an acting student, but I wrote my own monologues and I got in, I got a full scholarship based on the monologues that I wrote. <laughs> um, and surely not because of my acting ability, but they gave me a scholarship and I went to circle and I didn't last the whole time. Um, it really wasn't, you know, my thing. I They really want you to, you know, it, you're studying with some great people like Nico Sakharopoulos and Michael Kahn and Terry Hayden and all these great legends of the field. They did do shtick. They right. did do com, big, like, comedy. I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to be Dudley Moore. And so uh, I um, I didn't, it was not a, it was not a perfect fit there. But Donna Murphy was in my class, and uh, Andrew McCardle, uh, and is that his name? He was in uh, 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 Merrily, the original Merrily. I had a bunch of great pe- people that went on to do some great stuff in that class. That's incredible. How funny. This is great. And then you, what was the, what was the decision? What was the defining moment for you to go into writing? Because it, did it start in film and television? Well, no, I wanted to be a playwright. When I was young in, in the city, in New York, I made a living. Um, there was a magazine back then. I, I think it still exists. Like, it's backstage, or it was a magazine before the, sure. obviously, before the internet. Um, and the way you found out about auditions and things were through this magazine. And I put an ad in this magazine where I would write original monologues for, or, or scenes for actors for auditions or class. And I, I made a living writing for actors original original material so i think it, it started back then i always loved to write i just never kind of put together the idea that oh i can make a living doing that yeah um, but it always sort of was hello and then again when i went to so i would always write and i was in a comedy troupe um an improv comedy troupe with um this wonderful this uh, uh actress friend of mine that we would uh, write a skit and and do all kinds of great you know original stuff at the black box theater in new york down on west fourth street and so i've all, i always wrote i just it there was a what happened was i realized i'm never going to get to work as an actor and i said uh, i'm going to pursue writing and I, I couldn't get a gig in new york at all no one would hire me i mean it's so especially back then it was it's a real small club um, to be able to to get your first job as a, as a young player. The opportunities didn't exist as much as they do now. Right. I came out to L.A. for a number of reasons and sort of fell into the world of television accidentally and got this career out here that I really never expected to have, but always really my dream was always to be a playwright. Mm. And it started... Uh, when did, what was that transition for you with LA and writing for film and television? What was the, how did that, you know, playwright to TV and film? Well, you know, I, uh, I never really wrote, made it as a playwright in New York back then. So I came here with a pretty clean slate. Yeah. Um, it sort of, and it was sort of accidental. I, I had a friend, um, who, uh, I had moved to, uh, LA to San Diego for like a minute and then LA and I was waiting tables and I was just trying to make it. And a friend of mine was in the, the national tour of La Cage du Faux and was in LA and actually living with me. Uh, I knew him because his boyfriend was my best friend. And so my friend was on the beach hanging out and they ran into a group of friends and they were, they were looking, not granted, you have to remember this is the 80s. Uh, they were looking for a joint, and they and my friend said, I know where I could get a joint. Robert will have one, and they came to my house to get a joint. And um, <laughs> one of the friends of theirs was a, a guy who named Danny Margosis who worked at CBS as an assistant to somebody at, at, in, at the network, head of programming, and he wanted to be a writer, as did I, and we said, let's write something together. And we, I, I really didn't even know him, but we sat down and wrote a pilot together, and sold that pilot, and it happened very, it's not really the traditional way to go, because he was able to show it to people at the network, and we literally got our first gig like six months later, and it just started. So it's sort of, it's not really, I didn't know what was going to happen, but it just sort of, and it just kept going from there. What was, okay, so what was the early... It was just, you know, I always say... I'm sorry? No, no, go on, please, go on. I, I always say that success is this serendipitous meeting of opportunity and ability. Yeah. You know, you, you, I, 
I never didn't write, and I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to uh, prove myself, and I was ready when it came. Um, and I just think it's always d- doing your preparation, n- being ready, and just trusting that the opportunity will come. But that's that's what happens. It's a it's that it's that perfect storm of somebody giving you a chance and being ready when that chance comes. Yeah. Yeah, I this is uh, this is very interesting. So the first pilot you're writing there with Dan, are what was the, yeah. what were you learning about collaboration, and what was the what were the conversations like? How was the story coming about? Um, I don't rem- honestly. This was many years. This was the mid '80s, I guess. So sure. I don't remember who which, who came up with the idea. Sure. But I've always, you know, I've always been a collaborative spirit. I one of the hardest things to do when you're a writer is to just is the isolation is the hardest thing to deal with because often you're just in a room alone with your thoughts or with your characters it's, and you're sort of isolated. So I love, one of the things I love so much about theater is that it is so collaborative television uh, a- a- and film writing can be a little less collaborative. You're, you're, you know, often just on deadlines and it's just, you'll have your studio notes or your network notes, but then you're just off writing. Um, so I loved at that time having a writing partner because we could bounce stuff off each other. Um, but that's why I love theater so much, and I always did because it is such a collaborative art form. You do nothing alone. Yeah, yeah. That's... And so we just sort of figured it out as we went. There were certain things he was really good at. There were certain things I was really good at, and together it sort of made a good combination. We were, we worked together for about sixteen years. Wow. How how have you gotten better at asking questions in terms of maybe story? See, that's a good that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I think you just grow like any art form you grow as you the more you do it and the longer you do it you grow. Um, I, it's an, uh, I've I've always asked questions, but I think I've, what I've learned to do is ask the right questions is to you know understand ask those questions about this happens, therefore then this happens, that which makes this happen, which makes this happen, and how to, how to tell a story. I've always been really great, not great, I shouldn't say that. I've always had a, a gift for being able to write dialogue and character. Story, I had to learn. It was a little bit harder. And so I learned how to ask questions that really taught me how to tell a story. Um, the other stuff came a little, a little easier for me. So... What I've learned and what I continue to do is always ask those questions that are going to give you the best story, that are going to really let you understand what's the story you're telling, how are you telling it, how is it laying out, where where are those surprises, what is that inciting into that, what what are the beats that get you um, through that journey, and so those are the questions that I'm constantly asking myself. And you learn by doing it more and more. You learn what doesn't work, so you get sort of you start to get this shorthand, which you what. You, when you're younger, you don't know what it is you don't know. Mm. Now I sort of know the questions to ask. Right. What are, what are some of the questions to ask, if you're willing to share maybe on one particular mm, story? Uh, sure. First question I always last ask is, what time is and what is for lunch? Because <laughs> that, um, Perfect. <laughs> um, you know, you ask yourself, when you're writing a musical, you always ask yourself, why does this thing? Why is this a musical? Um, and you, you have to be able to, I don't, it's really easy to say, why is this a musical? Well, because they're singing, but it's right. not that it's music. You know, it's why is, why are the stakes or the story heightened enough, whether it's a comedy or a drama so that it lends itself to the art form of you get to a moment when a character must sing and not speak. And a story has, the stakes or the story have to be heightened enough, even if it's, not a drawing room comedy, even if it's just that it, it, that it, it works in that art form. So you ask yourself, why does it sing? What are the stakes? What do these characters want? What are their obstacles? How do they get in their own way? How do other people get in their way? And, and um, ultimately, how do they achieve or not achieve their goals? You, yeah. you sort of want to know, a lot of people, a lot of writers will do a, a very complicated outline before they start. I don't, but I just do have to know. I let the story tell itself, but I have to know those things before I start. Right, right. And, and for me, because I write comedy, 
why, where is the comedy? Why, why and how are they funny? Every character is funny in a different way. Sometimes this, it's character driven. Sometimes it's more joke driven. Sometimes it's the situation, the situation, but where is the comedy coming from? And what, what is the language of each character? Why are they funny? How are they funny? That's yeah. really important because you want to create characters that when they're saying something funny, um, no other character could say that. That has to come out of that character's mouth. Right, right. That makes total sense. I think that's interesting in terms of adapting, you know, films to musicals. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't take a film and put it on a stage. You, you can't, so we have learned. Uh, you know, it's interesting, though. I think there are certain certain movies, you know, you, if, for example, uh, I'll use Tootsie as an example, one because I, I just did it, is that, that that live and exist in the form that they are, and they, and they should stay that way, but at their core, at their DNA, there's a great story there. So if you're reinterpreting that for a different art form, like a musical, you need to reinterpret it. You need to go back to the source and 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 honor that, but make it give, make it its own thing and let it live in its and breathe on its own. Because otherwise, it's already been done. And when you and when it's been done by the likes of Larry Gelbart and and the such, you don't need to redo that. What you need to do is make it your own. Um, and I think that's sort of the where people are because you know there's a lot of adaptions going on on Broadway, which I think is a wonderful thing and a dangerous thing. Yeah. And so I, for me, for me, the and David Yazbek and Scott Ellis, the question was always, how do we make this our own? It, a movie that existed in 1982, socially and politically as well as as comedically, um, uh, it deserved and should live in 1982, but don't necessarily translate to to where we are now. So it's about figuring that out. Yeah. Do you have did did you or do you have mentors? And if so. Are there standout lessons they've taught you? Oh wow, that's that's pretty deep. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, you I have <laughs> men, Yeah, I mean, I you know, I have. There were writers and 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 comics that I idolized. I definitely grew up idolizing the, the uh, a, a few generations before me, the Neil Simons and the Mel Brooks and the Woody Allens and Sid Caesars and Imogene Cocos and Tony Fields and. Um, I, I loved those comics, uh, and those writers. So I very much, uh, uh, wanted, that's what I wanted to be. Um, and so those are really the people that I, especially, I mean, if, if I had to say there was one writer who made me want to do what I do, it was Neil Simon. It was his ability. It was his, that beautiful sort of borscht kind of comedy, but very real and very believable and very character-driven and truly situations that any of us could find ourselves in, and yet the comedy was always heightened and always just, um, it was glorious. I think, without a doubt, Neil Simon, I devoured everything um, it, it, he, uh, I, I ever read by him. Yeah. Yeah, he's written some really great stuff. Shoot, so have you. I, um, I, I would be remiss <laughs> if I didn't bring up Disney. Okay. I have to bring up Disney because it seems like everyone in entertainment crosses paths Walt, with Disney. Walt, him, Walt himself or, <laughs> yes, or the, the company, yeah. Disney. Disney Plus? Yeah, The new Disney Plus? Yeah. yeah, the Disney Plus, Disney Channel. Um, yeah. And it's my understanding that you have, you've worked for the company uh, previously. <laughs> I have many times. Yes. And I'm interested, you know, and I, I, I think of like the sweet life movie or Sharpay's fabulous adventure, the teen beach movie and teen beach Two, And it, you know, on the, on the surface, those are just like, I think they could be categorized as, you know, children's fluff pieces, but they still take a lot of work, a lot of dedication and a lot of, you know, thinking. And I'm curious, you know, yeah. the headspace you were in for working on those. Well, no, the Disney Channel movies. Oh, well, um, I had written a musical called Thirteen, right. which, um, yeah, which back and interestingly enough, it, it was a musical. Of, uh, you know, in fact, we're, Netflix is doing it as a feature now. We're just uh, in the process of of writing that. Um, That's so exciting! <laughs> they, they, it's really fun. But people sort of thought of it as a kids show because it starred a bunch of 13 year olds but in truth it was very dark and it you know it was really a little more true to life 
um, than you would find at Disney. But I got a call, at, uh, some executives at Disney had come and seen it and asked me to come in and, and, and write stuff for them. And initially, I'm not a kid's writer. I don't really write for children. I write really adult comedy. Right. <laughs> but at that time, nobody was doing musicals right. on television, especially only Disney. And I love writing musicals. And so I said, all right, you know what, I'll do it because it gives me a chance to write musicals. And I will say, they sort of, I understand, you always have to understand who's writing the checks. You know, because there are there's stuff that you write for yourself or there's stuff that you write to make a living and you try to find the perfect marriage of both of those. So I knew the brand and I knew the the franchise, I knew it was Disney and I knew the umbrella I was writing under, but they did give me a lot of leeway to write in my kind of my own style and my kind of comedy. I knew there was certain a lot I couldn't do because it was for children. Right. But they really let me they were pretty great to me and let me have a lot of fun with it. And especially with, you know, with the Sharpay one and the Teen Beach one, um, if you look at it, it's really, if, if you watch them, it is um, geared towards kids. But I, there's a lot of stuff in there that, is, that kids aren't going to get, but adults will. They let me keep my, um, keep my voice knowing that I was aware of the audience I was writing for. Right. But it does take a lot of work. It takes years to write them and to do them. Um, and and uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work. It's, a, it's also very interesting because on those movies, it's not one composer. There's a lot of composers writing the score. So I actually never work with the composers. Everything is very compartmentalized. I write the script and then say, this is where I think a song should go. And then Steve Vincent, who runs the music department up there, who's fantastic, finds the right composer for the right song and then puts it all together. You're sort of one piece of a puzzle, unlike, you know, when you're doing musical, when you're in a room with your composer all the time. Right. Yeah, that's got to be so different. It's, it's really different, but um, it's a machine up there. They know what they're doing, and they pull it all together. I really actually, once I said, okay, you're going to do this, I really had fun with it. it. They were a lot of fun. They were a lot of fun. Where what is your what is your writing style? Do you write in the morning? Are you just writing when you can? Are you? Um, I well, I, I you know I'm I I have a first of all it's interesting because your mind never shuts off. No, <laughs> you, when you're writing something, yeah. they never. You know, I think it's the same for actors. I first of all, God bless you. I I don't know how you. Mm, I love actors so much because I I could never do what they do, and um, but I do know that there are so many similarities to what I do and to what performers do, which is your mind never does shut off. Yeah. And you also understand um, that it's a, that it's show business, that part of it is art and part of it is business. And you have to be good at both. So, but I know I've gotten over the years, to put, I, I write every day that I don't take a day off. And even if I throw it away and I get up very early at like 4.30, quarter to five in the morning, and I have my coffee, and I go in and write, and I do all my writing um, in the morning. And most of my, and that's when I'm at my most creative, and uh, it's, I sort of, sort of, it seems to be very fluid early in the morning for me. And then also when I'm in the bathroom, I come up with great ideas. The shower is, <laughs> yeah. for some reason, when I'm in the shower, I come up with great ideas. And then, you know, so I, I really, I write all day, but I do my best work undisturbed really early in the morning. Um, and if I can get four or five good hours every morning and then I can fill it in during the day, um, with whatever else I need to, but that's my, I love that, that twilight, uh, uh, writing time. Yeah. Is it, um, and I, and I make myself do it. I, you gotta, I make myself do it. I mean, it is, it, it, you need, you need discipline. You, you have to be disciplined. Well, yeah, that was my next question is how, how do you cultivate that discipline or is there a way in which you place it in your mind? You look at your bank account and you say, <laughs> and you say, okay, I better write. <laughs> um, no, you, yeah. And you, you, I mean, I've been doing it a long time. You just try, you know, it's sort of like there are days as an actor or a dancer um, or, uh, or a singer. I'm sure you just you're like, Oh, I just don't want to go to class today. Or when you're doing eight shows a week and you're like, I just don't know how I'm going to get through this five show weekend. I don't know how I'm, I'm tired. I am this, I'm that. And you make your, you just make yourself do it. It's the same thing. I, you make yourself do it. Now, you know, I, I, and I'm not, I don't, listen, I'm not, I'm not hard on myself if I don't, if I, if I just, 
if I'm like, it's not going to happen today, I, I forgive, I'm forgiving with me, You're but, right. but I try really hard to just be disciplined because it is, it is, um, it's, it's work. It's work. You gotta, you gotta do the job. Yeah, it is. It yes. Yes. I'm curious. And I tend to take on a lot. Uh, I tend to take on a lot of, pro- this is such a cyclical business and you go through long stretches where, where you don't work and then you go through these periods where everybody wants you and you get offered a lot of stuff and so i'll say yes to everything while it's there well i know i can i have it Hello. and then i'll be like then it becomes about time management then it becomes about okay i got to figure out how i'm going to do four things at once and then it just becomes about clicking off of one show and and g- clicking into another and um and that's just discipline it is, yeah. And well, you made a you made a good point here about how you know it's either it's either raining and pouring with opportunities, or it's very dry, and that so comes from I mean relationships, particularly in entertainment. Everyone is like you're working with people you know or people who know you and know your work, and it's like that really in any field. But I'm curious what your views are on you know professional relationships within the industry. Well, um. Well, that's a good question. It's I think it's different on both coasts, but because um, I uh, I like to consider myself a playwright first and foremost, or a, 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 a librettist. I'll talk about New York. I I don't I have friendships in New York. My my most I've been very blessed. Um, I've been involved in some projects that were crazy with some crazy people. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, uh, but and you can read about those. Sure, but sure. um uh but uh i when i my theater relationships become friendships deep deep friendships i don't know why but i've been really blessed and i think it's just theater people in general it's it's things take so long and they're so often for so little money and you you're really working because it's a passion you form these these families, these bonds that are impenetrable often. Um, and I find that I have more um, friendships than work relationships. Uh, yeah. But I also think you also have to know, you know, sometimes you're in this situation, um, I, I'm working on a show now, which is my next musical coming in, and and um, there had been, you know, we've done earlier incarnations and readings of it and I, you bring friends in and you bring people in and often those people don't survive or, or you start moving in a different direction with the characters or a director wants some other people or whatever and it's painful to have to tell your friends, I don't think this is gonna, you're going to be able to move forward with this. So sometimes it's not a good thing to get attached to the people that you work with but ultimately everything comes full circle in this business and you find another way to work with them and so you just know it's not going to be this one, it'll be the next one. I got to tell you, uh, Clay, the, the, my families are the people I've worked with. I have collected this sort of, this, this clown car of misfits along the years <laughs> that have become, that, that are truly, I don't know how I'd survive without them. We, we, there's a support system there. So I think it's, you know, it's a, there are some, it's a business and you have to know it's a business and there are certain people that, you know, you have to keep as a business relationship. But it is also a very incestuous industry, and I say that, you know, in the spirit of which I say that, in other, which is that um, also often who you know. People like to work with people that they've worked with in the past and are comfortable with, and there might be a, a shorthand with, or they trust a bit to get certain things. And so it's also about um, making relationships and and kind of and not, not not being an asshole, <laughs> making yeah. people like you and want to work with you and doing your best work and showing up. And because um, people don't want to work with people they don't like. Sometimes you're forced to, but people really want to work with people that, we, you know, I was like working on Tootsie. I got to tell you, it was three and a half of the best years of my life. We had, regardless of whatever ended up on that stage, I, every day was a day uh, was joy and laughter. We, Yazbek and Ellis and, and, and Dennis Jones. and We laughed so hard. It was so much fun. It set the bar for me for everything else I want to do. And I think you hope that all jobs are like that. What are your views on kindness in life and in the industry? I'm so curious. Um, well, 
I think I'm, I, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Right. My, my, I'm kind of, I think there isn't enough of it. Yes. I think we have to, you, I think we'll, we'll, we, we have to try to find it at the most difficult moments <laughs> when it feel when you feel like it's not there. I think, um, it's so important to, uh, treat others with respect and kindness and and especially if that's what you demand in return yeah. um i think we uh are living in a time when it is not on the forefront of our uh, behavior i think we're living in a time where right now people aren't very kind or, or understanding i think in this in our industry there's so much i mean i've talked about this a number of times we spend most of our lives being told no um and i think we have i i i think most of us in this business have an inherent understanding of how much we need kindness because we deal with so much rejection yeah. and i think it's really important to remember when when you're when you're going through a difficult time because you're you're going to there's you can't that's Stock and trade with being in the entertainment industry, and especially to it's going to be it's not easy, and you're going to deal with a lot of rejection and a lot of pain. And rem those are the times to remember that you're not um, going through that alone. Most of the people around you are going through it as well, and so sh they show them kindness, and you'll actually um, uplift yourself. Yeah, uh, and and I so I I think there's there's not enough of that, and as as the ind as things get harder and harder, uh, and as you get older, I think we, we you need it more. But I think that should be at the, at the forefront of, of all that we do. Is think it's still we're doing theater, you know? It's like let's say, <laughs> we're not, we, we are we are we are we are we are not we're we're not saving we're restoring faith, not saving lives. Right. And right. Uh, I think yeah. Kindness should be at the forefront, especially when you're standing there in front of an audience of 1,700 people. You better be kind because if they're not kind to you, you're going to know it. Yeah, and everyone will feel it. What? And everyone will feel it. Is there a project you've worked on that has the most you in it? Um, uh, wow. You know, I think I, I've been lucky. I, I got to say, I've been lucky that... It, Almost everything I've worked on, I try to pick my projects carefully. Uh, but I've had a, you know, back in the old, in the early days when I got to do designing women and I got to write those incredible Julia Sugarbaker speeches. Um, that was I love. That was sort of very me. Um, you know, you go see like a, a, you talk about thirteen and Teen Beach and those young adult sort of things. There's a there's a there's a the innocence meets the cynicism of me are in all of those. Yeah. Um, Tootsie is definitely me. There's a, I did a show that I love, which is going to have another life, I believe, uh, called Moonshine in Dallas, which was very me, and I love that show. Um, there, you know, I think there's a little bit, you have, I don't think you succeed as an artist unless it's you and everything you do. That doesn't mean everything is going to be successful, right. uh, but I think they're, they're in, you know, if you, if who you are, and if, if what you do, whether it's on stage or off in the arts, if you're not true to who you are, it, it shows, and you won't, I don't think you'll have the career that you want. But as long as you stay true to whatever your voice is, and whatever, however you interpret that, um, you'll have success. It may not be the success that you think it's going to be, but you will have success. Yeah. So I just think, uh, for me, there's a little bit of me in everything. I mean, like I said, I've done stuff for money because I, you know, you have to make a living and you have to have your health insurance. Yes. So there's done stuff. I've done stuff that I'm like, it's not my favorite thing. Uh, I was, it's not my best, but I've been lucky that a lot of what I've gotten to do really reflects who I am as, as a, as a writer and as an artist. Are there switching that question on its head? Is there, are there projects or a particular project that has taught you a lot about yourself or taught you the most about yourself? Um, you know, Tootsie was very interesting. Uh, and I asked you, I, you know, I think for you as an actor, that's a very, I think even more so you, cause you're, I mean, you truly are living in the skin of somebody else. Yeah. So, but I, um, 
the interesting thing about Tootsie was because our because there's gender politics involved, and it really taught me to face as I as I think you always do, which is, and I said this before, um, to to really get in touch with that I don't know what I don't know, and uh, it and so I learned a lot about walking in someone else's shoes or trying to understand that. I learned that I should never try to write somebody else's experience, that I have to humanize the experience, the story the best way I can, but understand that I might not have lived that. And so um, talk to the people that have. You know, um, it was a, it's a story about a, a man who pretends to be somebody other than who he is, not only that, another gender. And, and I'm not a woman, and I, I don't have those experiences, but I can understand the humanity of rejection and the humanity of desperation. So I really, it made me a better person in, in really listening to, what, to other people's experiences and then learning how to translate that into my art form. Yeah. Uh, but if I tried to assume that I knew what I don't know, it, it couldn't have worked could work and I really that became really clear during that project how did your relationship with the project of Tootsie come about did you approach people someone approach you what was that no well I was doing a I had done a reading of another musical that the producers uh came and saw and then they um uh approached me and then a few years later they approached me um about doing it. i was working on another i had a tv show at the time um and another musical and so i i said i, I said no also i was really intimidated by the idea of doing tootsie i was like i don't i was really trying to def- make my mark in, in in the world of theater and I had done a few shows i had done like three or four shows but none of them were massive success hits or you know high profile shows I had done 13, I had done Lone Star Love, I had done Moonshine, I had done Day Ned, and I had done a bunch of stuff, but I was really waiting for that one big project that would put me on the map. And Tootsie came along, and I was like, I don't know, man, that's a pretty big target to put on my back. Um, and I right. knew that I didn't really want to do an adaption, that I didn't want to take a movie and just put it on the stage. Um, and Scott Sanders and Carol Feinerman, who are producers, who are fantastic. If, if you're listening to this and you get a chance to work with them, you're not going to do much better. Uh, and they, um, so Scott Sanders, I had, was doing another project with Scott Sanders. I was working on, there was a wonderful movie from the 1950s with, um, um, uh, Judy Holiday called It Should Happen to You. And I was developing it with Scott Sanders, who was also doing Tootsie. And he, his, he, he called my agent and said, I, well, I want Robert to come and meet on Tootsie. And I said, I'm going to pass on it. And God bless him. What he said to my agent was, you tell Mr. Horn he is in New York on my dime right now. He's taking this meeting. Um, <laughs> and so I took the meeting. And and at the t- and it was with David Yazbek. And I was like, okay, I get to be in a room with David Yazbek. Okay, I'm going to take that meeting. Um, and I really took the meeting because I wanted to be David Yazbek. Yeah. And uh, I took the meeting and I met David and we just, it was a bromance from the, from the very first day. We, we really, we, we weren't 100% sure what we wanted to do, but we knew very much that we agreed on what we didn't want to do. And that was a great solidarity right there. That was a great, we knew, okay. And we laughed really hard. And there were like three or four major changes that we both knew we had to make and wanted to make. And that, so that's, and it just, I said, all right, I'm in. And it, and it went from there. That's no, you know what that happened? I'll tell you what else did happen, though. They asked me to write a spec scene. They said, well, before we actually offer it to you, can you write one scene so that we can see what your tone of your comedy is? And I was like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I don't know. All right, I'll do it. And I, I was like, yeah, work for free? Uh, yeah. But uh, I wanted, at that point, then I wanted the job. And I said, all right, I'll do it. And I wrote a scene, and that scene um, is actually in the show intact as I had written it for that how funny so yeah what? yeah but that's how it happened it happened because somebody saw something else that i did and remember me that's you know again that's why there's no i tell actors especially all the time don't say no to stuff because you never know who's going to be sitting there watching you and remembering you i'll remember when we're casting i'll remember actors from something i saw four or five years ago in this in something really small, um, and I and I will um, remember them from that. They left an impression. So 
you know, if you can say yes, say yes, even if it's like this is bad, you ne- you, you know, do it anyway because you never know who's going to see you. That's so so true. I I want to just take it a, a step even further. I'm for my own curiosity with Scott. Was it his idea to take a look at Tootsie, and then he had to go find so, the rights? So Scott worked at Sony. Uh, in Los, he worked at Mandalay and at Sony for many years in LA. And I, and now I may not be a hundred percent right about this, but I believe the story is that at, when he left Sony, part of his deal, his exit deal was to have the rights to certain film properties to turn the stage. At that time, this was 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. Yeah. Nobody was doing musicals out of movies. Nobody was doing it. So he had the foresight to know, if I can get the, the, the separated rights for these movie titles and to, to be able to do them as theatrical pieces, he saw that there was a future in that. And one of those titles was Tootsie, and he always believed in it. He always knew it would make the right, and I and and it, it's no secret that over the years there were other people that had tried that he had hired and tried and it didn't work out. Right. Um, there had been a, there had been a number of other people involved in it, and so um, he it was part of his. He left Sony with a number of the rights to their titles because he had the foresight to know that there was a trend that that was a that was a coming trend. How how crazy <laughs> to have that foresight? Yeah, he's. He's a he and he's a brilliant producer. He understand he he understands art and commerce really well. He has that history of being in film and television and knew how to both bring that to the stage, but also knows what the stage demands. I mean, he worked for years at um, I believe at Radio City uh, and sort of re- gave rebirth to Radio City. And he's a he's a showman. He really is. That's that's and a, and a shaman and a shaman. <laughs> he's both. Uh, you you brought up a good point though about doing you know say yes to everything don't take a project no matter how small you never know who's gonna see you and yeah. see your work do you have any is kind of almost separate from that do you have any like favorite failures or apparent failures at the time that set you up for future success um every failure sets you <laughs> up for future success really it's true because. You can't predict what people are going to respond to or not. You don't know what people are going to latch on to. Um, you, you, you just try to do your good job and you try to do your best. But, you know, it's, success is an interest, a failure is an interesting thing because you can't control what other people say or do, but you can control how you respond to it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think every failure is a lesson to say, what did I do wrong? Why did not that work? What can I learn for next time? Um, listen, no, even the greatest success you have, um, some people are going to like, mm-hmm. and it's really, and, and so, and, and you also have time restraints. You look at you, no matter what you write, you look back at something and say, um, you know, I, I wish I had more time. I would have done that differently. But all, all failures, bad audi- it's like bad auditions. You can walk out of a bad audition and say, that was terrible. Uh, I sucked. They're assholes. It, this was a, and the heck with them. And screw them. Or you can say, okay, I, you know what I realized? I have to eat before an audition. Or I have to, I have to make myself be off the book. Or I, I have to really listen when they give me direction in the room and really take the direction and not get locked into what I'm doing. All those things that you learn when it doesn't go the way you want it to go. And it's the same thing for writers. I've done TV shows as well as, as, as theatrical pieces where I thought they were going to be incredibly successful. And I, and I, um, they did, they weren't. And I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe I didn't see that story the way I should have, or, you know, I guess I, I was looking at that show, that story through this prism and that was a mistake. So, so you, you do, you learn every, every, it's like reviews. If you believe the good ones, you, you then also have to give as much legitimacy to the bad ones because it's not just the people that are saying good things all right. You know, so, so you, you have to, you, you either pay attention to both or you pay attention to neither. Right. Uh, I always, I, people, there are a lot of people that don't read reviews. I do. Um, I, some, I don't pay attention. I, people will say stuff. Look, people will say stuff. There are people that have said something about Tootsie and I've said, there's, 
that's legitimate. That's fine. But it's clear to me you haven't even seen the show <laughs> because I can tell by what you're writing. See it and then, but but you know, I also know that if there is a it's sort of a unanimous um, opinion about something, if you're reading reviews and like six or eight different reviewers have said the same thing, you need to look at that and say, okay. Um, they're all pointing the same thing out. I need to. I need to work on that. It's something is not working. Yeah. At the same time, if you get, if there are certain, you know, if you're reading reviews and unanimously people agree something is working, believe that. It, you that means you you did your job. You did it right. So you know you have to you have to either not pay attention to either or pay attention to both. Uh, yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy to read. It's not easy to read uh, negative stuff about yourself. It's very hard or about your work, uh, but you also have to know when it's constructive and when it's it's not. When it's just yeah tacky. <laughs> um, exactly. In in your I mean, do you do you read review? Do you, um do you read reviews? Yeah, about oh, your yeah. performance. Oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. You do definitely. And do you believe them? Yes and no. I mean, I feel like I can hear in the language of the review if someone's having a bad day, if they don't like the show, if they're just being a bully. Or if yeah. they have something of merit, you know, they're saying something of value where I'm like, oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. Because they're not trying to make it sound mean. They're just saying, I don't like, you know, because there's certain yeah. views. And were you that, always able to decipher between those things or did that come with, with time? Oh God, no. Last two years. In the last two years, maybe. I've, <laughs> I've gotten that. You know, cause you get See? out of your own head. You know, you realize like I'm you not everyone's cup of tea. It. You know, not everyone yeah. wants to, not everyone wants some to drink are, me. And some, <laughs> not, yes, I know, but just deal with the people that are really thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just. <laughs> They're a lot more forgiving. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> uh, as we, as we wrap up here, Robert, um, in your quietest moment, what are you most grateful for? Well, I'm, you know, that depends whether you mean prefer, personally, professionally, but I mean, I'm grateful that I have been blessed with fortitude uh, and opportunity. Yeah. I, 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 through really challenging times when I just so many times where I just thought it's never going to happen, I never gave up. And that's my mom gave me that. My mom gave me strength. And my mom had a very difficult life, and I watched her never, never give up and have fortitude. And she sort of um, embedded that in me. But I, I, I'm grateful for. I have so much love in my life from so many people, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm grateful or lucky that I was. There's not many things I, I do well, but I was given this ability to make people laugh. I was given this ability to write comedy, which is my favorite, which is, gives me more the joy than almost anything in the world. There's certain things that gave me joy in my 20s and 30s, but I don't do them anymore. Um, but but <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was blessed with a, 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 a gift that I, that I happen to love, um, that I can... I can translate pain into humor and I can laugh and, and make other people laugh. I'm so grateful for that. I, you know, I don't, if I would have been given the gift of math, I don't know what I would do because I don't enjoy it. But if that was my gift, I guess I'd have to do it. But I was, it was, it was, a, you know, and, and I'm grateful for my, um, for my family, these people in my life, my, my, my blood family as well as my adopted family. I love that. Really, uh, it's very lucky. It's a this is a this is a glorious, glorious industry. Um, it's not easy, and it mm -hmm. it requires every drop of blood and sweat that you have. It truly does at every moment. Uh, but how lucky are we that 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 this was our calling? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I love that. Such a great answer. Um, as we as we as we end, my final question here, um, metaphorically speaking, if you could put a word or like a phrase on a billboard for millions of people to see, this can be an advert, a story, a quote, 
Does anything come to mind for you? Laugh. 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 That, that's my mantra. Laugh. People, laugh. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's all okay. It's all going to be all right. Just laugh. That's I love my it. mantra. That, that's good. That's, that's a gonna, mantra. That, that'll, be on my, that'll, be, that'll be on my gray zone. Just laugh. Just yeah. laugh. I love it. Robert, Although I'll probably be cremated, but still, <laughs> it'll be my ashes. <laughs> you could put it on the jar. No. <laughs> I put on the jar. Exactly. Uh, uh, that's funny. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add before we end here today? No, I appreciate you um, thinking of me. Uh, you know, it's it's so, it's crazy. You uh, um, you don't think anybody really wants to hear what you have to say, <laughs> and then you find out it inspires other people. And and uh, okay, here's what I will say: is do not um, do not give up. If this is what you want, it really can happen. I ne- this last year for me when I was um, given all these accolades and, and showered with all these glorious things, I never in my wildest dreams, I mean, I dreamed it, but I never thought it would actually happen. But if you just hang in there, it eventually you get your shot. You get your shot. Yeah. It really, it's true. I would say don't, don't let the business get to you. Just keep going. Yeah, it'll all work. You know out. what? You could end up. You could end up in Canada. Shoot, <laughs> in Edmonton of all places. <laughs> in Edmonton in winter. In winter. Fourteen degrees, baby. <laughs> but I bet it's beautiful. But I bet it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Oh my god, it's and, gorgeous. And when else would you have gone to Edmonton? Look at that. Exactly, and you know what? Probably. Next week I'm in Palm Desert, California. So it's just it's the way it goes. Are you? Oh, neighbors, you'll be near. Oh, oh, yeah. I love, it's, it's Palm Desert, Palm Springs. Yeah, Palm oh, Springs. Oh, you're gonna love Desert, it. Yeah. Oh, and there's casinos on your days off. Oh yeah, the I golden love days. Like, we go there out there all the time. <laughs> uh, where are you from? I'm from Long Island, New York. Oh, you're from Long Island. Where? Uh, Five towns. Yeah, Suffolk County, South Shore, East Islip, right near Fire yeah, Island. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah oh, great. Well, Robert, thank you for having this conversation. My pleasure. Thank you. It's so nice to, to meet you uh, virtually. Yes. Oh, so nice. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Robert Horn. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. 